Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kyrian. Today, we will continue our study through the book of James. Last week, we covered James chapter 1. Today, we are going to cover James chapter 2. Before we continue, let's have a word of prayer together. Father God, we all agree as starting this today. I am praying for your utterance to speak boldly to your people as your own oracle, that it will make my tongue as a pen of a ready writer. I am praying for the anointing of your Holy Spirit, anointing that will teach us today, guide us today, lead us into all the truth today. Dear Spirit of God, I pray that you will open the eyes, ears, hearts of everyone listening. Wherever they are listening from, minister to them simultaneously. You know what they need. Give that to them today, Holy Spirit of God. You are the teacher. Help us to find the truth today in the word of God as we glean through the book of James. Father God, I thank you because our faith will always have a corresponding action by the power of the Holy Ghost. Our faith will always be our fruit. We propose always to be doers of the word of God, not just hear us only. And we ask for your help, Spirit of God. Dear Father God, in everything that you have done, that you are doing right now, and you will do in the future in our lives. I take no glory, we take no glory, but we give you all the glory, honor, and worship. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. And everybody say, Amen. Dear friends, today I welcome you again for another teaching. Uh, last week, like I said, we covered uh, James chapter 1. Today, we're going to be covering James chapter 2. But let me give you a brief summary of what happened last week. Uh, we started the book of James, and uh, James is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. When he wrote this letter, it was a time of uh, persecution, especially after the death of Stephen. So many Jews, believers, left town. So they were dispersed in different areas. James wrote to them, encouraging them in their journey giving them hope in their persecution. So if we want to put a summary to it, he tells them that um, persecution is a way of Christian growth. So if we talk about Christian maturity, he brings out three ways of Christian maturity. First of all, through trial. Secondly, through temptation. And thirdly, being a doer of the word of God. Today, we will continue with James chapter 2. And we can go ahead and start. James chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory with partiality. So James is writing, it's the same letter, you know, um, men put them in chapters and in verses later on. So when it was originally written, it was just one letter. So he continues to speak to them about now partiality. The word partiality, we don't use very often in our modern vernacular. Rather, we have words like uh, racism, bigotry, prejudice. So he's telling them here not to hold the faith 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. He's telling us here, with God, there is no partiality. With God, there is no discrimination. With God, everyone that is born again is equal in his own sight. So he begins to give them this advice. Notice that he said, brethren. So he is talking to people who are already Christians. Yes, in the world we live today, in the system all around us, you find racism, bigotry, prejudice. But James is telling the ones now who are saved that this thing should not be among them. Even though we see them outside, but when we come together, it should not be anywhere among us. Not only that we should not have them among us, but when we go out to the world, because the Bible says that we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So we will walk as Jesus Christ worked. We ought to be examples so that people seeing the light in us are attracted to come to Jesus Christ. So he tells us not only should we not do this in the church? But we, when we go outside, we ought to work just as Jesus Christ worked. He brings up so many examples. In the Bible, uh, if you go to Romans chapter 2, verse 11, there is no partiality with God. So God does not look at us differently. When we come into his own kingdom, he sees everybody the same. He looks at our feet, not how much money we got in our pocket, or the color of our skin, or how brilliant we are, or how intelligent we are. But rather God looks at us, he looks at us as his own beloved children. And by grace and love, he visits every one of us. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 25, I'll read that to you. Anyone who does wrong will be repaired for the wrong, and there is no favoritism. So he's telling you here, God doesn't have favorite children. He's not going to say, I love that one so much so he can get away with whatever he want to do. It's fine with me. And do you see that one over there? I am waiting for him to miss it. <laughs> and that will show him. <laughs> so with God, there is no, he says, there is no favoritism with God. He doesn't consider one person above the other, just like the people in the world will do. So this is what uh, uh, James is trying to inculcate in the lives of the believers through his writing. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 9, the Bible says, And you masters do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. He's talking about masters, those who are privileged over others in this world. People that we will say they are people of some means. He's telling them not to show partiality because God himself does not show such. So he's telling us to be, to imitate the life of Christ in our dealings with other people, especially those who are under us. I'll give you one, one more reference in the Bible. We are still talking about partiality here. So it's a very big thing. And uh, uh, James wants us to get hold of it so that we can keep away from any social injustice. It's not allowed in the kingdom of God. In Mark eleven fourteen, 14, I'm sorry, in Mark 12, 14, this is about Jesus Christ now. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, 
We know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the persons of man, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So these are the Pharisees. They came to Jesus. They don't want to get hold of him. They don't want to get him in trouble with the law or with the governor. So, but they noticed here. You see what I said? He says, he doesn't pay attention to the persons of people. Good means uh, he shows no partiality. He's not a man pleaser or a man worshiper. He treats everybody the same. So that's what he's talking about here. Now we go to verse 2. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy rags or filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you will sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, You will stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So he brings out an illustration here, an example. Back in the days when uh, James wrote this letter, we had we have masters and we have slaves. Then half of the Roman Empire were slaves. About 60 million people, they were slaves. But when Christianity came in, when the gospel came out, and people, the Gentiles came into the kingdom of God, it was so common then that when you come to the place of gathering, you will see a slave and the master in the same place. Why? Because the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ has made everybody equal, the same. So now he's telling them that this is a common practice whereby you will see the master is in the same place and you see the slave is in the same place not to show any preferential treatment. But everybody there should be the same in the sight of God as brothers and sisters. Remember when Paul was writing to Philemon. And he tells Philemon to welcome Onesimus, who was a runaway slave, as a brother. No longer should he treat him as one who is a slave. But he encouraged him. Philemon to welcome Onesimus as a brother in Christ Jesus. It tells us here that it is very, very wrong. Because while we are doing this discrimination or racism based on how well they dressed or their um, pocket, it means how much money they got, or their educational background or their color. While we are doing this um, uh, uh, discrimination in the church, he tells us here that it's very, very wrong because the modus operandi or the method of our judgment here is based on outward appearance. But God himself does not judge that way. That's why he's encouraging us not to judge people based on their outward appearance. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, you remember when God told Samuel to go to the house of Jesse and anoint David as the next king of Israel when um, Saul was rejected by God. When Samuel went over there, Behold, he saw Eliab and said, the God's, God's anointing is with him. He saw him good looking, tall, with a good countenance and stature. So he concluded by outward judgment 
and say, yes, God anointing, God's anointing is with him. But God spoke to him and said, do not look at his countenance or his outward appearance or at his stature, for I have rejected him. And he said, men look on outward appearance, but God looks in the heart. For us, it is wrong because we don't know the condition of heart of a person. We can only tell what is outside them, what we can see, what we can hear when they speak. But the Bible says their heart is very deceitful, intentionally wicked, above all, who can bear it, desperately wicked. So you cannot see the condition of, of a man's heart. It is impossible. That's why he says when we judge, we should not judge looking on the outward appearance because we, we will always miss it. When you judge based on what you can see, what you can feel, what you can hear. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 28, remember Galatians chapter 3 verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. He says in the sight of God. It does not matter anymore whether you were bound or you are free. Whether you were male or you are female. Whether you are a Jew or you are a Greek. He says, in the sight of God, we are all one. Everybody is equal in the sight of God. So he says, skip away from preferential treatment, from partiality, from racism, from bigotry, from prejudice. None of these should be found in the house of God. There are people in the church. Because there are people of some means, we have given them some preferential treatment. I have been in a church or in churches where they will have the names of people in the pews, which means in the front seat. Names of people written in the ch on the chairs, in the seats, so that whenever they show up, even if they show up 20 minutes late, they're going to walk all the way from the back of the building all the way to the front to that seat designated to them. Why? Because they gave some donation to the church. Because they helped the church build something. Or they gave money. Or they are people of some means or some influence. So now we have, we give them preferential treatment. And this is still going on today in churches. So that is why James is writing, encouraging them to stay away from this practice. There is not anything to God because God does not operate that way. So as we are imitators of Christ, the Bible tells us, we should walk as Jesus Christ walked. So now, every, every class distinction, every social injustice is abolished in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The day you say yes, that day you said yes, and make Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior, we, you become equal in the sight of God. Because we are approaching God now based on what Jesus Christ did. It's not based on our own merits or on our own self-righteousness. Our approach to God now is based on Jesus Christ. When God looks at us, he sees Jesus. So, if we are coming to him, that's why the Bible says, come boldly unto the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace for help in the times of need. 
Our boldness to, in, in the presence of God is based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So when we come into the place of worship, when we gather together as brethren, we should see each other as one in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5. Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in the faith, in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the court? Do they not blaspheme, blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? He's asking them the question now. He's beginning to compare now when you do that preferential treatment. He's trying to give you now some background. Based on spiritual standpoint. So he tells you here. The poor man that you are discriminating upon. He says. This poor man. The one by the standards of the world. You said he is poor. He says this one here that you said is poor. Is a joint heir with Christ Jesus. He says, is a seed of Abraham, as according to the promises of God. This one that you are discriminating upon is the one that Jesus Christ will say, you have been faithful over a few things and that will make you ruler over many. Therefore, enter into the joy of your father, into the joy of the kingdom. The one that you are discriminating upon and then he turns around and he tells you, the rich, the one that you are giving all this preferential treatment, the one that you honor every time you gather together, he says, are they not the one who drag you to court? Sometimes you notice there is a malarism among those people with some meats. They always have that um, entitlement mentality. And when they don't get their way, they will threaten. For them, they feel like it is their own right. So you must give it to them. Even in the house of God. There are churches where you see the rich that he's talking about here. They will come up with petitions and they will try to bring so many people in that petition just to get rid of the pastor. Why? Because they had a disagreement. So he wants to show that he has some influence, some connection in the church. So he engages other people in his own petition to get rid of the pastor. These are the things happening in the church. And James is saying that these things, they're not supposed to be so. They're not. Now, don't misunderstand me. There is nothing wrong with being wealthy. He's not talking about the ones who are wealthy, but they still understand that we all are one in the presence of God. He's not talking about these ones now. You can see the illustration he gave here. Those are the ones that are so braggadocious, who this look at themselves as uh, extraordinary, uh, uh, different from other people. These are the group that he's addressing here. Verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, yet you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, 
you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Here, he begins to tell us the importance of keeping the royal law. And why do we call it the royal law? <laughs> because it was given by Jesus Christ, our King himself. So we call it the royal law. He gives us the importance of keeping the royal law. He says, and the royal law is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you go by the royal law, you will not break, you will not, you will not show partiality. There will not be any place for partiality for racism, bigotry, injustice. If you would keep the royal law of loving your neighbor as yourself. There are people, they believe that because it's just a, 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 a preferential treatment, so nothing is wrong with it. So he brings us, he brings another illustration. You may think there is nothing wrong with it, it's just a simple uh, injustice, but it is still missing the mark. Transgression means that you know something is wrong and you went ahead and you do it. That's what transgression means. So don't think that um, it's just a, a simple impartial, uh, 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 simple partiality. So there's nothing wrong with it. It tells you that uh, it's the same, missing the mark in the sight of God. But if you would go by the royal law given to us by Jesus Christ himself, he says it will eradicate every partiality in the church. So he brings you now to love. And someone will say sometimes it's difficult. But remember the Bible tells us that the love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts. By the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. The Holy Spirit of God who dwells in you now makes it possible for you to be able to walk in that love. Even when physically it is difficult for you to do it. But trusting in the Spirit of God who is now one with your spirit. He gives you that enablement to be able to walk in love. So he tells you about this royal law not to forget it. That when you go by this royal law, it is going to eradicate any chance of partiality among the brethren. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We go to verse 12. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. He's telling you now. To do and also speak as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Now, what is the law of liberty? The law of liberty is the law of freedom. Freedom in Christ Jesus. Made possible by Christ Jesus. Before you were born again, before you came to Christ, you were a slave. Of sin. Your spirit was dead, separated from God, alienated from God.
you had no other choice to but to sin because that's your spirit because that's who, who you are appointed unto wrath dead in your transgressions so there was no other choice the physical senses dominated your spirit your spirit was dead completely in God but when you get born again that's what when, be born again means that your spirit became alive again in Christ Jesus so the moment you get born again your spirit comes back to life. Now, the Holy Spirit of God moves in you. And he becomes one with your spirit. And he gives you that enablement, the strength, the ability to be able to rise up above the demands of the flesh. So now you were able to make choices. Now, Sinning becomes a choice. Before you were born again, you had no choice. You were born that way. You, 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 you had a sin nature. So all you did was to sin. When you got born again, the law of liberty becomes alive in you. So now you got the choice, the ability to say no. I'm not going to do it. I have, even though I have my liberty, I will not do that. I have my liberty now. I am no longer a slave unto sin. I am no longer incapacitated. Right now, I have the ability to resist. So he's telling you here to speak and also act like one who has the choice, the ability not to go into partiality, not to engage in racism or bigotry. That's what he's telling you about here. It's amazing that we have now that law of liberty. That we are no longer hemmed in by Satan in his kingdom of darkness. Where we were before we came to Christ. But the moment we come to Christ, we are now we are now transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Where we have now the ability to say, no, I am not going to do this anymore. Remember, the Bible says, even though all things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient. Even though all things are lawful to me, not all things are edifying. Even though all things are lawful to me, I will not be put into the bondage of any one of them. So I have now the ability, the choice to choose not to do such. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we go to verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So he begins to tell you now about judgment. One thing with the book of James is that he changed this topic very often. That's why many people recognize it as the book of wisdom for New Testament. He changed this topic very often. He's talking about judgment here. That we don't have to judge, even though it's connected to what he, he, he uh, 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 partiality in the church. He says we ought not to judge it's the same judgment because when we do the outward, when we do our judgment based on the outward appearance, he condemns it. So he says we should not judge. The Bible says. Judge not so that you will not be judged. For with what measure you meet, it shall be measured back to you again. Remember in Luke 6.38, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together. And running over shall men give unto your own bosom. 
sometimes when we hear this scripture, we think it's all about giving and receiving something like money or finance. It's not limited to that. As a matter of fact, it's a spiritual law. Whatever you give is what you're going to receive. If you, if you are judgmental and you judge everything you see, everybody you see, that's what you're going to get. The bad news is you're going to get more. So <laughs> if you judge, you're going to have good measure pressed down with judgment coming to you. If you sow friendship, you're going to get good measure pressed down with friends coming to you, overflowing. So it tells us here, judgment belongs to God, not to us. Why? Because we don't have the necessary criteria for judgment. We don't have all it takes to judge. We don't know the heart condition of the one that we are judging. We cannot see above the physical appearance. So that's why judgment is reserved to God. Because the moment you become very judgmental, that's what you're going to receive in return. As a matter of fact, you're going to have a miserable life. Why? Because you're going to be so scared now that people that you have judged will judge you. And honestly, they're going to be, they're going to be watching you very close just to catch you, miss it. And they're going to rain judgment upon you. So <laughs> that's why it is. It is very, very wrong. You pray for them and you ask God to open the eyes of their understanding. And perhaps they will recover themselves from the snail of the evil one. So that is what to do. We don't go into judgment. We reserve that for God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Glory. Hallelujah. Verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus, also fed by itself, if he does not have works, is dead. Now, this is the challenging part for many Christians. The challenging part. So pay attention so that you will understand this. This is the challenging part to so many Christians. And the reason why it becomes a challenge to them is because this, some people will take some of the verses that I just read now, they'll take them out of context. And remember that every time we take a test out of context, it becomes a pretest. Every time we walk away from revelation, all we got is our own imagination. So when people do this, then it becomes difficult for them to understand it. But I'm going to break it down so that you will not miss it. Martin Luther, in his... Um, Opposition of Catholicism started Protestant Reformation. He had so much trouble with this. The reason being that um, the same thing that I said earlier, contextual extrapolation. So he he takes it out of the context. When he read Galatians, the Bible says, the righteous shall live by faith. And then he read Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, 
not of works, lest any man should boast. And then he turns around and he reads James. And James is telling him now that faith without work is dead. So he's so confused, so troubled about this, that at some point he wrote to remove the book of James from the Bible. The problem he had was he was taking it out of context. So now, I'm going to make it very easy so that you will understand this. It says, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works, can that type of faith save him? In, in Pauline epistles, the epistles written by Paul, he talks about righteousness by faith. He talks about for you to have a right standing with God, which means for you to be born again, it is only by faith. Faith alone. It is not by works. It is not by the how good you are. It is not by your self-righteousness. It is only by faith in what Jesus Christ did. That's what Paul wrote. So he wrote about the root of faith. Justification by faith. Standing in the presence of God by faith. Now James is talking about the fruit of that faith. I pray that this will become very clear to you. James is talking about the fruit of that faith. James is talking about here... If your salvation was genuine, if it was real, if that day you said that I, I make you Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, if you really believed it, James is telling you here that it's going to be a fruit that will accompany that faith which you believed with and became born again. So this is what James is writing about here. James is not talking about that for you to get born again that you must have works. That's not what he's saying. Paul wrote that for you to be born again, it is only by faith. James is telling you here, after you get born again, which is the second step, after you get born again by faith alone, there has to be a corresponding action. Remember there are people who will say the prayer of salvation just because somebody is bothering them. So they don't want to get that person out of their way. They don't want to be bothered anymore. So they raise up their hands and they, and they say the prayer of salvation. But they did not mean it. They did not mean it. God looks at the heart. He knows the one who is truly repented. The one who said that prayer with all his heart, God knows. There are people that were invited to the church by their friends. And when they made the altar call, their friend kind of pushed them, go, 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 go. And they just came and said the prayer of salvation, but not in church. And they go back, they live the same way. But, if you really, really say that prayer with all your heart, your spirit will be recreated. The Holy Spirit will take his abode in you. Then he will enable you. Remember the fruits now, you don't labor for the fruits. When you look at a tree, the branches are where the fruits come from. And you don't see those branches laboring. As soon as they remain in the vine, they will bear fruit naturally. So, as soon as the Spirit of God is in you, 
and you have yielded yourself to the promptings and the leadings of the Spirit of God, you will bear fruit. So this is the fruit that James is talking about here. So many Christians, they have problem understanding this. And they say that this should not be in the Bible, but because they are taking them out of context. And whenever you do that, something taken out of context, you can make that scripture say whatever you want it to say. You can make it say everything, anything you want it to say. Because you are out of the context. So that is what he's saying here. I, I believe that you on that the Holy Spirit of God will open the eyes of our understanding to give us this revelation knowledge now. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is why Jesus Christ said, Why do you call me Lord, 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 and you don't do what I say? Because there are people who are not really born again. I mean, they said the words. That is why James says, can this type of faith save you? If you say that you have faith without works, can this type of faith of just lip service, of just saying, I am born again, I am born again without meaning it in your heart. He says, is he going to bear fruit? Will we see any fruit that will come out of this faith that you said you have? So James is saying here, if you really made that commitment, there is going to be an evidence, fruit, corresponding action that can be seen, that will manifest as a result of that inward change. That is the word he's talking about here. In verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. James is telling you, he continues to tell you here that those two things are inseparable. Faith and corresponding actions. He says, if it is a real faith, if you really, really got born again, he says there will be a corresponding action. There will be a fruit that someone can see. Both of them, you cannot separate them. But when you say that without meaning it, there will not be any fruit. So you say that, but you can't provide any fruit. Then he tells you, He says to the one who really believes, there will be a corresponding action. You cannot separate the two. That's what he's talking about here. In verse 20. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without work is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified, justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. This is the troubling part especially the verse 24 that I just read now. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. But it's very, very easy to understand if you follow what I just said prior to this time. And I'm going to try to make it help you to understand it. So he's talking about Abraham here. He uses Abraham as an example. Now, remember that Abraham was justified 15 years. 15 years. He was justified by faith. 15 years before he offered Isaac on the altar. The Bible tells us that. It says Abraham believed God and it was recorded unto him as righteousness. This is 15 years before 
he offered Isaac. So now, because the faith of Abraham was real, genuine, he had a corresponding action. There was a fruit of that faith. When he was justified, it was only by faith. But because it was real, that faith produced fruit. And that fruit, the fruit the faith produced, the fruit that he was willing to offer Isaac on the altar. So the offering of Isaac to God was a fruit of the faith of Abraham. That's what he's saying here. So initially, justification of Abraham was only by faith. But because it was a real faith, it produced a fruit. And that fruit was when God told him to offer Isaac. He obeyed God. And that became the fruit of his faith. Or we can say the corresponding action or works, as James puts it here. In verse 25, likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? He gives you another example of someone who believed and their faith produced fruit. Like I said earlier, you cannot separate the two. Show me someone who is really born again. Not lip service. Not the hypocrite. The one who is really born again. Show me that one and I will show you the fruit of his salvation. It gives us another example. You remember Rahab? When the people of Israel, after they left, Israel, uh, after they left the Egypt... And they were marching towards the promised land. And now, Joshua sent out two spies to go into Jericho so that he can, they can spy the place before they go take it. Rahab, they already heard about what God did in Egypt for the Israelites. How he parted the Red Sea. How the armies of the, of, of, of Egypt were destroyed. In the same Red Sea. When they heard about this, their hearts were filled with fear. So Rahab believed in the God of Israel. Because of these stories, because of these miracles that she heard. Now to give it a corresponding action. When the messengers came to spy out the land, she received them and uh, Send them out on another way. So this, it shows you here that not only that she believed, but she also produced a fruit to correspond with the faith or the belief which she had. That's what it's saying here. And furthermore, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without work is dead also. Finally, now, he's telling you the same thing, that you cannot separate two of them. If your, if your faith cannot produce result, if we cannot see any fruit manifesting from your faith, it tells you it's very simple, it's dead. Just like a body without a spirit is dead. But he's telling you if that faith is real faith. The one that really is saved. The one that prayed, prayed that prayer of salvation and it was from his heart. He tells you that naturally there will be fruit in the life of that person. It, it, will, be, it will be very evident. You can look and see. Yeah, I see. There is something different about him. There is something different about her. Look at her mannerism. Oh, something is completely different. That will be a result. 
But don't not misunderstand it. That result is not what saved you. What made you, what saved you is because of your faith alone in what Jesus Christ did. I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you will open the eyes, the heart of understanding of everyone listening and teach them, put in them this knowledge, understanding that they will get a hold of this teaching. For this has troubled so many Christians. But you are the greatest teacher, Spirit of God. So I trust that you will give them the revelation knowledge. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good friends, I've come to the end of today's teaching. So we covered, we've already covered James chapter 1 and this is James chapter 2. Next week, we're going to cover James chapter 3. If you miss anything, you can go to our web, you can go to our website. It is www.kuim.org. We have all the teachings there. So at your own convenience, you can always go in there and you can listen to any of the teachings. Or you can go to our YouTube channel, Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. And all of our teachings are there to help you in your Christian work. If you're listening to this message and you are not yet born again, which means you are not a Christian yet. Perhaps you were a member of a church. Perhaps you were also baptized in water. And you think, yes, this is salvation. The Bible tells us that that is not so. There are so many people in the church who are not yet born again. Simple because they don't understand what it means to be born again. Simple because they are trying to approach God based on their own self-righteousness. Based on their own good works and the things which they have done. So to be born again means that you put aside all your righteousness and everything that you think you're doing good. Put them outside. Put them on the side. You come to Christ and you depend on him 100%. Depend on what he did at the cross. So you believe he is the son of God. That he died for your own sins on the cross. And that God raised him up from the dead on the third day. Then you ask him to come into your life. You invite him to come into your life and become your Lord and your Savior, which means the one you submit to. And once you do this, you begin a relationship with him. That's what it means to be born again. The Bible tells us there is no other way you can do this, but Jesus Christ is the only way. That is why in John chapter 14, verse 6, the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So there is no other route. No other route. The way is not broad. It's a narrow way and the straight gate. The Bible tells us. Jesus Christ is that only way. There is no other name under heaven that is given among men whereby we must be saved, if not the name of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus Christ says to Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It is not possible. You may belong to a different religion and you say, We serve the same God, but our manner of approach is the only thing that differs. You may say, Always lead to God. But that's not, that is not correct. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible tells us that if you reject Jesus Christ, you cannot have access to the Father God. It is only those who have Jesus Christ that will also have access to God. So that is why he's telling you that the day you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Come as you are. 
Jesus Christ already died on the cross. He's not going to die again. Salvation is now made available free of charge. All you got to do is to believe in your heart. Receive him as your Lord and your Savior and you will be saved. You got to be the one to make that choice. No one is going to make it for you. Behold, I stand at the door and I, I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I will eat with him and he will eat with me. It has to be your own decision because God created us as free moral agents. And he cannot violate that. He gave us the right to choose to make our own decisions. So you're going to be the one who will say, I choose Jesus. I make him my Lord and my Savior. But I'm telling you now, the moment you do that, you become born again. And if you would die, you will spend eternity in heaven. Don't say, let me go and get my acts together before I will come and become born again. You don't have such times and you, you don't even have the ability to do that. That is why you come as you are. Once you come as you are, he's going to change you from inside out. He's going to recreate your spirit. He's going to give you the ability to live a better life. Now, there is a place called hell. And I'm going to warn you about that place because it is a real place. The only people who are there now are those who rejected Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It is a place of darkness, a place of torture, a place of torment. As a matter of fact, hell is just a temporary place. The Bible tells us that death and hell will give up the dead that is in them and they will be cast into Gehenna. Now Gehenna is a place of almost darkness that Jesus Christ talked about. The way that will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for eternity. Man is a spirit, so your spirit can never die. But there is only two locations after your spirit leaves your body. Either it goes up, if you met Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it goes to heaven. Or it will go to the heart of the earth, which is hell. If you rejected Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, that is why now is the day of salvation. The moment is here right now. Today is the accepted time. Don't prolong it any longer because you don't have that time. Tomorrow is not guaranteed to you. Just today, about 155,000 people died. One day alone. Where did they go? It depends on the choice they made when they were alive. Once your spirit leaves your body, it becomes too late. No one is going to pray you out of hell. It's impossible. That's what the Bible teaches. So you're going to make that decision today. Jesus Christ says, if you don't believe that I am he, you will die in your sin. He that believes not is damned already. Because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten son of God. He that has the Son of God has life. But he that has not the Son, he will not see life. And the wrath of God will abide in that one. So what are you waiting for? I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. Short one, but powerful. If you believe, and you pray this prayer and you mean it with all your heart. You're going to be recreated right now. You're going to be born again right now. And if you will die, you will not go to hell. But you will spend eternity with God in heaven. So pray this prayer with me. And mean it with all your heart. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And I believe he is your son. That he died for my sins. And you raise him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, I ask you this day to come into my life. And be my Lord and my Savior. 
I believe now that I am born again by faith. I believe now that I'm a child of God by faith. I believe now that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life by faith. Father God, I give you all the glory for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you pray that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. Now, there is a subsequent experience. We call it infilling of the Holy Spirit of God. Evident by speaking with other tongues. If you want to get more information on that, go to my YouTube channel, Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. There is a teaching there titled, Speaking in Tongues is for Every Believer. It will teach you, it will guide you on how to be filled with the Spirit of God and speak with other tongues. Remember that you are now a baby Christian. You just got born again. You got to grow in your faith. So it will be very, very imperative that you find a very good church where they teach the word of God. So that you can grow. Because James says that desire the sin Peter says, desire the sincere make of the word of God that you may grow thereby. I want to use this opportunity to thank our partners all over the world, those who are helping us through their prayers and through their financial assistance to spread the gospel to other people at no cost to them. If you want to become a part of this ministry, you can log into our website, www.kuim.org. And there is a donation button there where you can securely give your gifts to help us even minister and reach more people for Christ. It is only those who hear the word of God and they do the doers of the word of God. They are the ones who get the full benefits of the word of God. Surely there is an end and your own expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Nagosko Bragen Guruto Alama Engrendem Spisko Guruto Kutu Bagiela Santa Bante